Timothy, let no man despise thy youth. If you want people not to despise your youth, then you've got some things that you ought to be doing. So he says then in verse number 12, but be thou an example of the believer in word, in conversation, in charity, in spirit, in faith, in purity, till I come give attendance to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine, neglect not the gift that is in thee, which was given thee by prophecy with the laying on of hands of the pre uh, presbytery. Meditate upon these things. Give thyself wholly to them that thy profiting may appear to all. Take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine continue in them. For in doing this thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. So he's saying now Paul is writing to Timothy and he's saying, Timothy, you set the tone. You set the direction. If you don't want people to despise or look down on you, you got to do something. And I'm here to tell you as a pastor, as the founder and, and, and the, 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 the person that's kind of been studying young adults and been looking at churches and been reading for the last four or five years on what, what's going on in our churches and in the independent world, the Southern Baptist world, and, and just singles in general. Here's what I found. Young adults make the difference. Young adults. Our church, when we started this, our church exploded. When we began to focus ministry on young adults. Now, a lot of churches say, well, preacher, we just can't reach them. That's a lie. That's ridiculous. Now, truth is, I can't reach them. But every one of you knows people that aren't saved and not in church, and you can do what I cannot do and you can reach your friends. Now, once that begins to happen, they get saved, they get right with God, they get plugged into ministry, and all of a sudden, a church is literally electrified and vibrant because the bottom line, other than this morning, which apparently is an abnormally, com young people normally bring life. They bring excitement. It, you know, well, we gotta find something for young people to do. That's the dumbest statement in the world. Put you in a room, you will find something to do. You'll find each other. You'll find ways to, to do things. And so when you start talking about how healthy is your church, where is your young adult? Seven out of ten Southern Baptists leave church after high school. Six out of ten Independent Baptists leave church after high school. And then we look at the health of our churches, and you go to big meetings, and you say, well, let's see how the meetings are. And you say, blue hair, blue hair, blue, blue hair means old people. Blue hair, blue hair, blue hair, blue hair, blue hair. Oh, there's a young person, 45. Oh, there's a young person, 50. We have gone to meetings, and we've looked around, and, and, and I'm like, where? Where are the young people? No wonder our churches are crazy and fighting over stupid stuff and, and, and involved in ridiculous things because old people get in a cocoon, they get in a shell, and, and, and they begin to kind of to, to just live in this little bubble. Young people bring life, and they open the church up instead of closing the church up. I'm going to prove this from the Scripture. Watch this. Number one, Paul said to young adults, you be an example. You be an example. And then he lists what? About five things, six things. He says, number one, you be an example. And what he means by here is you set the standard in your church. Old people talk about things that don't matter to a large degree. Now, I'm not talking about not hyper generalizing. Young people talk about relevant, current issues. So let's talk about number one, you set the standard. When it comes to, what's the first one he says there? Word. Now, what does that mean? It means what you're talking about, what your conversation is about. Set the standard in your church for what's being talked about. Do you know what old people talk about? What's the budget? What do we, what do we owe? We've got to pay off our debt. Old people get concerned with finishing the race 
Young people are starting the race. And as we get older, we're thinking about landing the plane. We're thinking about covering the bills. You know what, young people? Hey, let's start this. Let's do this. Let's try that. Old people are saying, well, can we afford this? Well, you know, our church right now, we're, we're, we're getting rid of all these pews. Uh, hopefully August, they'll all be gone. And uh, we're going to chairs because we can fit more people. And, and our young people are like, man, that's great. We can get 80 more people in here. Oh, that's wonderful. And the old people, I like the pews. They're comfortable. We've been sitting on pews since 1957. Oh, young people don't care about the pew and, and, and the history of the pew. Go study the history of the pew. It's a bench. <laughs> young people say, can we get more people in here? Can we, can we use this building to get more people? Old people, but I like the... I had a couple leave the church because we're going to chairs. No lie. In their 80s. And, and a church that goes to chairs is going contemporary. Okay, a chair is not contemporary. We've been sitting on them since man is out of bottom. But you're talking about what can we do? And, and the older people are, well, we can't do that because you know it costs. Well, we can't do that because we've never tried that before. Set the standard in word. What's your conversation? Most of your conversation, if I said, what's your biggest burden? You got some friends that are a mess. Your family's a mess. I mean, you got some things that are, you're really burdened about. And, and you know, I talk to my old people. Well, preacher, my back's hurting and I'm going to the doctor. And, and it's a different philosophy. Go to some churches and the conversation sounds more like an oncology clinic. Where they're talking about all their ailments and hurts. Go to a young adult meeting. Hey, hey, what about so-and-so? What about so-and-so? What about this? It's the example of what's being talked about. Evangelism, outreach, uh, excitement, programs. Let's try something. Well, preacher, we can't try that. We tried it back in the 70s. It didn't work. Y'all come along. Let's try it. You don't know whether it will work or not. You, you know what? It, it's a man. Worse than else, we talked about this. Well, our pastor is a little reserved. He's not sure. You know why? Because he's, he's got, as you get older, let me just tell you, fear becomes, begins to play a major part in your life because you're worried my legacy will be tarnished. What will people think? When you're young, you don't care as much about the long-term future. Let's try it. If it doesn't work, we've got time to come up, uh, try again. What are you talking about? Set the standard. Don't wait for somebody to say, do this. You go do this. Set the standard in word. Number two, what did he say? Set the standard not only in word, but you're to set the sample, uh, example in conversation. Your general behavior, your deportment, how you conduct yourself. Set the standard. Set the standard in how you behave. You want to have an exciting church, you've got to be excited. You want to have an aggressive uh, evangelistic church, you've got to be talking about Jesus. You, you want to have good worship, you've got to sing. You want to be involved. You want to be active. Hey, your, your generation, your guys, you watch a church. You watch our choir. You watch our bus ministry. You watch our children's program. You watch old people. Not, not all. We have some, and, and this is not an old people bash. We have some wonderful seniors, some great seniors. But just, just they cannot do what they once could do. You don't, you don't have that problem. The other day, let me tell you a true story. I'm 45, I told you that. So I'm playing first base on our, our softball team the other day, and I'm, I'm at first base. I'm, I'm a pretty decent athlete. I used to be pretty good. I'm heavy now and old, but, but I'm sitting there at first base, and the uh, first ball goes by, second ball, you know, over there. About the fourth ball is hit down the line to first base. And my body said, go get that. I mean, my mind said, go get that. And I, I made that play a million times. I dove to my left. I extended. About midair, my body said, this ain't a good idea. I landed awkwardly on my shoulder. And when I land, that's a lot of landing. <laughs> and man, phew, boy, I got up and that thing was just, oh my goodness. About an inning or two later, shot to my right and my mind said go get that so i dove to my right this time in midair my body said oh no 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 and so instead of extending because by now my arm was hurting so bad i just turtled brought my arms back in and just landed and rolled 
And, 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 and I'm like, oh, my word. And so I'm looking around, and, and, and myself, Brother Paul was pitching, uh, Brother Daryl, Brother uh, uh, Bobby, and one other guy. Five guys, all above the age of 30, 35, we're all done. I mean, Achilles is blown, quad is blown, ham is blown. My rotator cuff is partially torn. And I'm looking around, and the young kids, man, they're running after a ball. And the old guys are like, <clears throat> we, look like a, we look like a Sunday night walking dead. I mean, here at the walking dead marathon. Come and, and, and you know why? Because we just cannot physically do what you do. Your, your general deportment, you have life. You don't have, most of you don't have big mortgages. You don't have uh, big families. You don't have, and so, man, you can be active. You can show up. You can go. We, we can see what can be accomplished if your lifestyle is just, oh, we can do this. Many of us would love to do, but we just can't physically do anymore. Your deportment. Your conversation, the manner of your life. Man, you guys can go all in right now. That's what Paul said earlier. He said, look, if you want to get married, that's fine. Go get married. He said, but I'd like you to be like I am so that you can just go all in. Until you get those burdens of life, and, and burdens are blessings, by the way. It's just another stage of life. It's a great thing to get old, by the way. I, I'm not shy. I love being where I am. But, but until you get there, you can go all in with your life, and you don't have to worry about jobs and kids and other bigger pressures that will come but right now everything you do can be about lord you want me to go hey i'm not i don't have anything else really pressing i'll go to brazil for three months i'll, I'll go to i'll go to to london hang out with the silversons and pass out tracks for three months i'll 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 just go and volunteer at a summer camp for three months or a month or six weeks. I'll go on every mission trip to church. I can raise two grand and go on the next mission trip. Why? Because your lifestyle is such that you can go all in. I've got people, a preacher, I'd love to go on that trip, but my, you know, I just can't get off. You know, I just can't. My family, I got this. Your lifestyle, you can go all in. Number three, he said, uh, example in charity. What's the word for charity in the Bible? The word for charity in the Bible is? I was asking you and you didn't even respond. The word for charity is? Love, thank you very much. Did you know that? Love. Okay, love, love. All you need is love. Love makes the world go round. You know that it's, it's interesting. As you, as you kind of get a little bit through life, you begin to internalize your focus. You, you kind of, if the Lord keeps your heart fresh, you don't. And I, there's some of us that as we get older, we understand that we're not just all about our four and no more. But when you're young, you see things differently. See, when we get old, we, we kind of get, uh, uh, you know, set. We kind of get our, our philosophy. This is right, this is wrong, this is cut, this is dry, this is black, this is white. I mean, this is just how it is. And so when people come into your world that don't fit your mold of what a good Christian should be or what a good person should be or what a normal person is. When you get old, you're like, man, they're weird. You know, we have people come in our, our church or, or whatever, and you can watch our old people. They're like, look at that. You know what? If you guys can't love your own screwed up generation, who is going to? I mean, that's just, that's just, you know, it's just, we, we, Garrett, they, they're in, they're, these guys are in the class that I teach over at the Bible College, and, and I'm trying to get across to them, you're not going to meet normal people anymore. Not that there's ever been, but man, we've just got to the place in our world that, that crazy is the new normal. And, and some of our churches, they won't come in because they feel, I don't belong here. Now, our church is a conservative church. We're very conservative. We're, we're not anally conservative, but we're very conservative. But we have made it a massive point. I don't come in, I don't care if you come in looking like anything. And I, I, I could give you some crazy examples. You need to absolutely feel welcomed, loved, wanted in this place. And, and, and I don't care, listen, I don't care if you come in looking like 
uh, one of those ta you know, TV bad tattoo shows or whatever. I don't care if you come in pierced, poked, prodded. I don't care if you come in uh, whatever, relationships. I don't care how you come in. We want you to be accepted. Now, we're not condoning crazy or sin, right? It's, it's Bible is very clear. If it's wrong, it's wrong. But if you're not going to welcome people into your church and into your life because they don't look like you, if all your friends look like you and act like you and talk like you and smell like you and think like you, you're not opening up to anybody else. We've got this idea, well, we cannot let them contaminate us. I, I understand that. And, I, man, we preach separation. We teach separation. We, we do a good job with it. But at the same time, you have to love people where they are. And so the point of this is, if, if, if I'm not going to get the 80-year-old woman most of the time to go up to the two lesbian girls or to the two homosexual guys or to the biker guy or whatever say, hey, come on, sit with me. But I should be able to get the young people who are struggling with a lot of the same issues to say, hey, come sit with me. Hey, we're going to go all have, we're going to go to Panera afterward. Let's go. This ought to be the group that is setting the standard, raising the bar when it comes to loving people. You say, well, preacher, you know, they, they scare me. They scare me too. By the way, you scare me. In fact, you scare me more than they scare me sometimes because you think you've got it all figured out. The deal is they know they don't got it all figured out. That's why they're trying to figure it out. So, so we ought to be raising the bar. This group ought to be raising the bar when it comes to loving people. That's what's been so amazing about our church. Let me tell you a story real quick. Uh, 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 oh, man, six months ago, uh, I'm sitting here. It's before church, and I'm just kind of hanging out over here, and a guy walks in, true story, good-looking kid. I mean, good-looking kid. And uh, black hair, uh, kind of, if it was, it was longer, if I remember right at the time, blue jean shorts and a tank top. No shoes. No shoes. And his friend came in, had, his friend had shoes on. But look, you know, just jeans and, 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 and they sat right there. And I, I, I'm like, Sunday night, Sunday night. And I went up to one of my guys and said, I don't know anything about those guys. So just make it, keep an eye. Because we do live in a kind of a, uh, we live in a kind of a crazy area. We, we've had people come in. We had a drunk guy come in one time. No clothes on at all, but a pair of little shorts. And while I'm up making an announcement, he Sunday morning come right up to the front and, uh, I mean, right to the platform, drunk as a skunk, no clothes on, just a pair of shorts, just, just, and, and, and I'm like, somebody help me. You know, finally one of my ushers came. And then I noticed somebody had given him a welcome packet and set him down before he made his move to the pulpit. So I'm thinking, one of my ushers dropped the ball early on this one, you know. I don't, I don't mind you coming in, but maybe we should get the drunk guy some clothes before we seat him on the road before he can get to the pastor. So we're just kind of always wary about what may come in. We've got a lot of, lot, of, lot of militant kind of people around here. And so I'm sitting there and said, man, just, are these guys here to cause trouble? So I went up shook their hand. Hey, man, glad to have you. Glad to have you. Good to have you. And I said, what are you doing here? He said, one of your girls turned out, I think it was your sister-in-law, if I'm not mistaken. I think it was jail. Uh, Angelica or Melissa had met them downtown and uh, gave them a track and, and they came to church and so afterward he's like yeah I go to Indian Rocks Baptist Church up here he said I play in their worship band he said love the Lord he said we heard you preach from that old Bible we love that old Bible we just like to hear it preach and we thought we'd check you out turns out his name is Jet he's been coming for months now on Sunday night and uh, every now and then popping on Sunday morning but he plays in the worship band at a big Southern Baptist Church in our town and I totally misread his whole appearance. He, he does not wear shoes anywhere. Anywhere. The boy doesn't wear shoes. Now, if we go to Starbucks together, he'll put on some flip-flops. Say, preacher, what's his deal? He's just a kid trying to figure it out. He's one of these earthy, swear to promise, he's earthy, and he feels like if he doesn't wear shoes, he's more connected to the ground, to the ground and electrical currents or something. Anyway, uh, <laughs> I love him, but man, hey, that's a little weird, right? I wear shoes. I, I you know, your feet stink. And so, but my point is, one of our girls met him. Then our guys have been loving on him and just so them. What happens if somebody comes into your church with no shoes on? Oh, bless God, <laughs> we're not fundamental anymore. Oh no, no, you don't know the story. We, we've had we've had all kind of people come in. I, I told our church, listen, we're not condoning sin. But we're going to love people. 
And, and, and I, I'm not going to get the 50, 60, 70 year olds. To, now, in our church, we're, and I'm not bragging on our church, we're a little bit unusual. We actually do have a great church of older people, and some of you that are around here understand that. But most of this is going to come from your age group. You're, you're going to look at the tattooed, pierced, poke, prodded guy, and you're going to say, no big deal, because your, your culture, your generation kind of used. Matt wears that boggin all the time. That boggin, I don't understand wearing the boggin. But y'all see that all the time. People wear boggins in summertime in Florida. Again, a little special. But um, stuff like that, we look at it and go, what? What's going on? And you guys, you say, that's just, that's just, you know, he's doing it, whatever. So if you're not going to reach out in love, well, our church doesn't love anybody. Could it be that you don't love anybody? Because, see, Paul's saying to Timothy, you set the standard in this. You said, is it true at Chelsea that the young people can set this standard better than some of the old frumpety ones? Absolutely. Absolutely. If you're not setting the standard, you say, well, preacher, I'm not an usher. Who cares? When did it, when did it say be an usher to show love? Well, I'm not, I'm not in leadership. Who cares? By the way, most of the time, if I'm in leadership, I've got other things on my mind like the sermon or whatever. I don't have time to go around. Instead of just hanging out with your little group, and that's fine. You can have your little group. But instead of hanging out with your group, if somebody walks in and they're just kind of sitting there, hey, take your little group to them. Set the standard in this. People around here, do you, what did I do last? Okay, quick bonus, quick quiz. What did I do last night at the bowling alley? W walked around. How many times did people say, do you want a bowl? And what did I say? No, I'm just hanging out. Why? Because I want to make sure that none of you were just kind of sitting over by yourself, drifting into the, uh, the to, to kind of this oblivion of, of, well, I'm here by myself. There ain't nobody talking to me. So what am I doing? Hey, go talk to this person. Hey, Why? Because I want everybody here to know, man, we're so thankful you're here. We're so grateful you're here. I want you to have the best week of your life. I want it to be fun. I want you to enjoy. But I want you to meet somebody. I want you to get to know some folks. And most of all, obviously, I want you to hear from God. Well, preacher, well, what are you doing? I'm trying to show you that you can make it. Every Sometimes all it is is get out off that thing. Right now, get out off that thing. Just, just behave. And you're just showing, hey, I care. Well, preacher, nobody did that to me. So you're going to be bitter the rest of your life because nobody was nice to you. He didn't have friends must show himself friendly. If you're going to make a difference in your church, you've got to set the bar. And so many times we deal with this in our youth group. So many times a new kid will come in the youth group and, and it's like, you know, they have the plague until you figure out do they fit or not. Listen, most of you are weird and I love you to death. And if you went into a new church, they would treat you that way. So you know what? You need to just suck it up, buttercup, and you need to go and say, hey, welcome to our community. Set the standard. Well, they don't look like me. All the better. All the better. Because that means maybe we can reach them with the gospel or we can help them. So number one, we're going to set the standard when it comes to uh, our words. We're going to set the standard when it comes to our, lifetime, our lifestyle. We're going to set the standard when it comes to love. Now, we need to set the standard with our spirit. Our spirit. Well, what, what is our spirit here? Well, in, in this sense, and, and, and spirit in the Bible can obviously mean a lot of things but we need to set the spirit or set the center when it comes to our spirit and the word here means to govern your passions to govern your passions not every single adult from 18 to 37 or whatever our demographic is is out of control not not everyone not everybody's out of control some have figured out that that we can love god we can do right, serve God, and have a tremendous Christian walk. Well, preacher, all my friends, well, no, that's not true. Never, never, never can you use all, all, all. It's never all your friends. It's never everybody. It may be most. It may be some. Do you know that the media tells us that, that everybody's gay? I mean, every TV show has got a, like multiple, you know, modern family. There must be there must be 70 percent, 50 percent of America is gay. Center for Disease Control, Atlanta, Georgia, just put out the statistics. Do you know that three? You're from three. Is that England? Is that how you do it? Three, America, three. Three percent of the population identifies themselves as gay, bi, 
transgender, what's the last one? Trans, whatever, they're, they're the four that they are. 3% of the population, the whole group of non-heterosexual behavior, 3% of the population. Now, the media, you would think that's a lie. That's the Center for Disease Control, the people that do this for their life. They've identified that 3% of all America is messing around with the, op the members of the same sex in some way or another. So, so the idea that everybody's lost their mind, yeah, I know, I know that many of us understand that a lot of people are, but, but you don't have to. You know, it's, it's, not, it's not impossible to do right. If it were impossible to do right, then, then, then I should just quit. And we should turn this into single vision Really, we should turn this into mingle vision and just be done with it and go on. But the truth is, we do this conference to remind you there are a lot of other young adults that actually have a heart for God, that actually go make a difference in their world, and, and that you do not have to, to, to end up with the wrong guy, the wrong girl, the wrong place, the wrong time, doing the wrong thing. You can govern your spirit. And you know what? If you would set the standard, it might help somebody else in your world, in your environment, those around you. If you'd say, you know what? I'm not going to be like everybody else. I'm going to be the guy that actually stands out, and I'm going to set the standard. And, and whether you do or not, that's great. And, and I'm not going to be mean about it. I'm not going to bash you because you don't want to love you because that's one of the other things we're setting the standard in, right? But I'm going to be the guy that's going to be I'm going to be the girl that's going to live in such a way that you can look at me and say, that's a good Christian, and they don't have to be 45 years old. They don't have to be 55 years old. They don't have to be 70 years old. You can point to somebody in your age back and say, you know what? That's somebody I can respect. That's somebody I can look up to. Not everybody in your life ought to be old that you respect for being a Christian. You ought to be able to look at somebody in your life and say, you know what? That's a good guy. They love God. I, I, we have a little girl. A little girl. She's a grown woman. Uh, Susan Susan came through here as a missionary on her way to Chile anybody know Susan you know Susan you know Susan Susan Moore Susan Chacon now Chacon right so Susan was on her way to be a missionary in Chile I'm Chile's correct Chile and uh, and, and man just loved her to death and uh, she you know she just just our girls loved her and, and we've talked about her for a lot of her ever since she's come through and that's a, an awesome young lady and Susan went on down to the to the mission field and found a husband and just had a little baby and yeah 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 everything's great but my point was here's somebody that's single that's normal if you met susan she was normal you think all missionaries are crazy and i know the her star but other than that but um all missionaries uh you, you think oh they're 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 they're, they're they must be weird susan was normal she was awesome she was wonderful she was sweet she was godly she was good and she was 30 years old you don't, you don't have to wait until you're 50 to have a good testimony. Now, you don't have to be ridiculous about it. Walk around with your King James Bible the size of a Buick. I am very spirit. No, your lifestyle, all these other things we're talking about, you're just, you're just in control of your spirit. You're not letting your passions control you. Passions are good things. Emotions are great. I love them. But, but they need to be controlled, not control you. Let me give you... I, I, I didn't... Uh, real raw relevant we still have that so some things we'll say and, and you're adult so you should you should get this uh, sex is not a need in life it's a want you can live without it some of you don't think you can but you can live without it and, and you can control that because Paul teaches us the Word of God to how to control our bodies and some of you are being controlled pornography and sex and all these other things and 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 this is what the Bible is talking about you need to set the standard that, no, we don't have to be like everybody else. Our spirits can be governed, our emotions, our passion. Uh, number, I think we're on number five, faith. Set the standard. All right, listen, no secret here, right? The Brockmans are our special guests this week. Everybody that was here last year knows what happened, okay? And you say, oh, Brother Sansel, that's awful. Yeah, that is awful. I mean, that's, it was a terrible, terrible, terrible wreck. But let me tell you something. If Jason and Mindy would not be walking with God before the wreck, after the wreck is not the time to find God. The, 
the faith that we're talking about, some of you don't understand this, but you're going to need that kind of faith in your life at some point. You're going to need that. Jason did a uh, message Sunday night here on doubt and fear. And you're going to need that message at some point where, where you don't doubt, but just believe God. And you say, well, preacher, that's never going to happen to me. You can't say that. You can't say that, that something terrible. Every one of you is going to go through something in life that's going to shake you to the core. Now, my, my big one, and I've had others since then. I've had two or three. In fact, I've had some the last couple of years. But my big one was 18 years old. I, I'm, I'm playing football at Maranatha Baptist Bible College. And my mom walks out on my dad after 25 years of marriage and ministry. Uh, let me explain. You don't recover from that quickly. And that's what sent me into my tailspin for those next five, six years. But my point was, you know, if I'd have had a relationship with God before that, I might have could have survived that. But I didn't. So, man, that thing hit me. And it overwhelmed me. Some of your friends are going to need your faith because they're going through a hard time. You're going to need your faith because you're going to go through a hard time. Some of your family is going to need your faith. I've watched a couple of young people right now where mom and dad are relying on a child's faith to get them through a trouble. Set the standard. Well, Brother Samson, you're the pastor. You're the old guy. No, 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 no. God is no respecter of persons. You don't have to wait till you're 35, 40 years. No, you can have extreme. By the way, you want, to, you want to do a quick study? Go back and look through history at some of the great men and women of God. Before their 30th birthday, they had done amazing, amazing, amazing things for the cause of Christ. Some of the greatest missionaries you've ever heard of, some of the greatest pastors you've ever heard of, some of the greatest Christians you've ever heard of, they were all done when? When they were young. When they said, I will not take the family fortune. I will not take the path of success. I will take the path that God chooses. You say, well, how old were they? They were in their teens. They were in their 20s. And they said, I believe God. What? Listen, what John said last night, I don't know if you caught that. And I know a lot of you were tired and like most of you guys were sunburned. But um, I don't know if you understood the power of that message last night. But here's the deal. You will be able to take shortcuts, but they never get you to your destination. You've just got to say, you know what? I just believe God can do more than this. And I'm going to, I'm going to not take this path that is the easy path. Some, listen, you know why I do this? Because two years ago, I broke two fingers preaching. Uh, I hit the pulpit three times in a row and shattered two bones. So now I look like a homosexual doing this all the time. But it's because I don't want to hit the pulpit anymore. But some of you want a relationship so bad that you're going to take a shortcut and you're going to be with someone that you know is not God's best for you. I'm going to tell you, 18 years of pastoring. Tommy, how long have you been pastoring? 20, 12, 15 years, 17 years? John's not in here. He'll tell you. My wife's back there. I'm going to tell you that that shortcut right now, oh, man. Whew. Your, your consequences later, oh, my goodness. Rest of your life. Some, some of you are thinking, man, I want, to get, I want to get to the top so fast, I'm going to take the shortcut. Oh, man. Your consequences for that shortcut, I'm telling you if you will believe God right now, Step out and say, Lord, I'm just going, I, I believe, help down my unbelief, but I'm going to believe anyway. You are going to find that God will do much more than this. And our theme verse, Ephesians 3, 20, exceed, think about this, exceedingly, abundantly, above all that you can ask or think. Now, dude, listen to me. If you think you can think big thoughts, you compare your best thought to any thought God has ever had for you, and you'll be amazed that what you thought was black and white and what God thought was high-def plasma. You're settling. You're settling because it's easier. It's right now. Don't sacrifice the eternal on the altar of the immediate. Just believe God. Well, I haven't found anybody. I'm 25. So what? So what? Enjoy being 25. You, you know what it means if, if you, you're not... You're not, you're not 
found your place in life. Well, I really haven't found my career. I really haven't found the person. You, you know what that means? That means you can do anything that God wants you to do. I'm going to take a week off and go to conference. I'm going to take a month off and, and go on a missions trip. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to work at VBS because I, I don't, you know what? Well, preacher, I just haven't found it. If you found God, you found it. And whatever God wants at this point in your life is exactly where you need to be. Just believe God. It's okay. Set the example. Some of you guys, if you would lead in this, your friends would follow. Your friends would follow. They, they would say, you know what? If he can do it, I can. If she can do it, I can do it. Set the example. Uh, number five, purity. Number six, purity. Set the example. I heard a message today. It was not by one of a, a guy that, that runs in our circles, but the great message. He said, let me tell you the best advice I can give young people. Three things. Number one, get out of debt. Number two, stay out of bed. And number three, clean out your closets. Get out of debt. Stay out of bed. Clean out your closet. Some of you guys, you're young and already you're, you're finding out that credit cards and student loans and all these things, they are friends of a lifetime. Get that cleaned up in your life. Don't, don't, be, don't be a slave to the lender. That's a biblical principle. If you borrow money that you cannot pay back, you're a slave lender and you'll never pay off credit cards at crazy interest rates so you've got to go ahead and Jason will say much more about this stuff but but get out of debt don't take Mr. Student Loan don't take Mr. American Express into all the rest of your relationships in life number two stay out of bed stay out of bed simple stay out of bed had a, had a family in my office a couple weeks ago or not a family a couple and two two single guys uh, two single people and uh, and they messed up and, and I said look I said I'm not mad I said I'm, look, this is this happens but it happens when you don't plan ahead. It happens when you're not thinking this could happen, so we're not ever going to get to a place that we have a possibility. Just get yourself out of positions where you can forever mess up your life. Stay out of bed. Stay off the Internet. If, you, you're, if you're dying with pornography, get some help. Go talk to your pastor. Go talk to your pastor. Get off, get off the Internet. Get off, get, go back to a flip phone, okay? Go back to no phone, get, get off the iPad, get off the tablet, uh, get off the smartphone. Pornography, it desensitizes you to the opposite sex, to where they become objects and not people. And, and you're, the rest of your life will be messed up. You, you, you're, the studies that are coming out right now on pornography and our young people, the average age, Valerie, did they say 11 years old or 7 years old? 11 years old, most young people are now being affected by pornography at 11 years old and that is a, that is a the, 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 the truth is a porn addiction is a stronger pull than a coke addiction the, the, the porn addiction is a stronger pull than a coke addiction so, so stay out of it purity purity some of you were bothered last night by the videos and I, I don't like that at all I wish we could rent the whole place we can't uh, and, and yet the reason you were so bothered is because that's your area that you're really struggling in and you see that kind of stuff, all of a sudden it starts to churn up in you some things. And so you, you just got to get away from that. You're never going to, we live in St. Petersburg, Florida, okay? So we're never going to get away from immodesty and, and just crazy. Listen, you go to Mandera Beach, you'll see, a, you'll see the nastiest transvestite you've ever seen in your life. He walks the beach two times a day in the morning and evening. He's on the, he's on the internet, famous transvestite for being such a nasty person. It's awful. Whereas he's... 60, 70 years old, wears a string bikini, no lie. You, you, my kids, my kids, my little kids were, were out there, they were like, oh, okay. It's, it's every, you're not going to get away from it, but you don't have to dwell on it. You, you're going to see stuff. Just the world we live in, but you don't have to dwell on it. Get out of bed. Get your, get, get, get your mind focused on things above. And there's biblical principles. Our RU program, Alan Courtright, is, they're, they're doing some wonderful things helping people get themselves together see see some help get that squared away and then number three clean out your closet clean out your closet some of you are going to go into any relationship and we're going to talk about relationship my wife and i are going to talk about relationship later but you're going to go into relationships with some real mommy issues and daddy issues and man issues and and again statistics are overwhelming with the amount of abuse that people deal with today physical sexual abuse it, it's a terrible terrible thing 
And, and so, so you think, well, I'm going to go into a new relationship. I'm going to go the rest of my life. If you don't deal, listen to me. Right here, we're done. Two minutes. If you don't deal with your past, it's going to haunt your future. Okay, some of you have got some stuff, and you just keep shoving it in your closet and shoving it in your closet and shoving it in your closet, and, and you think, well, I'm not going to talk about that. You better talk about that. You better get you a good godly man or good godly counselor and, uh, and you say, hey, I was molested. I was abused. I was beaten. Uh, I, I did some things. Here's some stuff. There's some stuff here that haunt me. Say, preacher, I'm just going to keep it buried in my closet. One day, somewhere way down the road, you're going to go by that closet and you're not even going to open it, but you're just going to bump it and that closet is going to fall out on top of you. Now, you mark this down. If you don't deal with the issues in the past, they're going to haunt your future. And it's going to be in the marriage bed. It's going to be in the marriage life. It's going to be in ministry. It's going to be somewhere down there where you never saw that coming. You thought you had repressed all that, and then all of a sudden, something's going to happen, and it's going to be like a fountain that you can't close. Remember a couple years ago, that, that big oil rig in the Gulf went off, and they couldn't go down and close that pipe? They, that all, all that oil just kept dumping in the pipe. That's some of you right now. You, you have hidden this. You have repressed this. You have not dealt with this. You have not confessed your part of this. You have not forgiven the other people in this. You have not cleaned out that closet. And somewhere the cap is going to pop off that and it's going to come all over your life. You, you, th this thing of purity, it's, it's getting past the past. Some of you are saying, we're going to talk about that in a session in just a moment, uh, getting through some of those difficult things. You've got to deal with that. You've got to keep your mind clean. Say, so, preacher, what are you talking about? I'm talking about you are to set the standard for your church. Well, preacher, we're waiting on our pastor to really lead the way in single adult. Your pastor is not thinking single adult. He's been married 30 years, got five kids. He's worried about college for his kids. He ain't worried about reaching single adults. I'm not saying he's not worried. All of us want to reach people. Well, pastor, as soon as those jolly 60s get fired up, our church will get fired up. Jolly 60s don't bring revival. They don't. Jolly 60s are not going to show up for a prayer meeting seven nights in a row like our kids did for this meeting. It's just not going to happen. They got too much. First of all, jolly 60s don't come out at night. It's 5 o'clock. We're having the early bird dinner, and we're going to bed after watching Jeopardy. If revival is going to come to your local church, to your life, you can't wait on me. You can't wait on the older people. You Let no man despise thy youth. You set the example. How can you despise a young adult force that is on fire for God? Now, I've got, I've got more notes here than I can c cover forever. But, but if, you go, if you go to the last verse, there's so many things I'd like to say. But if you go to the last verse, look what the last verse says in verse 16. And we'll, we'll, we're closing right on time. Take heed to thyself and unto the doctrine. Continue in them. For in doing this thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. Do you know what happens when you set the standard? Well, obviously it's beneficial for you. But them that hear thee. You want to get the jolly 60s fired up? You get fired up. You want to get your mom and dad's, the, the, the married couples fired up, the, the middle-aged couples fired up? You get fired up. You want to get the teens fired up? You get fired up. You want to get the young kids fired up? You get fired up. David Dumas is the hero to, to, my, to my son Grant. Y'all see my son Grant right around here? David Dumas, if David Dumas said, uh, we're going to jump off the Rainbow Bridge, Grant would come with all of his friends and they would jump with him. You know why? Because to Grant, Davy is his hero. This age group, is the one age group in the church, now watch me, that has two ways to impact. You impact all the young guys because they think you're the coolest thing in the world. And you impact the older people. Our, I wish more of our church family were here, but our church looks at our single vision and it stirs them up. And we're talking the older folks, we're talking the married folks, we're talking all the way. They love what goes on in our young people because they see it. They see it every week. That choir is loaded. And you know what? The vast majority of young adults. Our buses, we have five great big buses and one small bus. And uh, uh, our bus ministry, three out of the five routes captained by young adults in this conference this week. 
our, our junior church program, uh, our 226 was our bus ministry, our, our programs throughout the church littered with young adults. Our RU, half our RU is young adults. Half our RU is young adults, true? And you say, preacher, there must be a screw. No, they just figured out RU is a great place to get their friends to come who won't come to church, but they'll come to RU. And we've seen amazing things happen there. You're the one group in church that your influence goes both ways. It goes up and down. If your church is dead, don't blame your pastor. If your church is dead, don't blame the old people for losing the faith. And by the way, if you'll study that little passage, there's so much more right there. But you know, you know where the doctrinal conversations come from? Young adults. Because you're figuring out your belief system. And you, you study it. You, you're the one that keeps the issues fresh, the doctrine, the philosophy, the ministry. If your church is struggling, it, it's, not, it's not necessarily the old people's fault. You make the difference. You set the standard. You know what your role is in our church? Your role is to bring life. Your role is to bring excitement. Your role is to bring accountability. If I'm not, if I'm, if you want to go and I'm not leading, I got to step my game up. There's a lot of pressure, positive pressure, that you guys can bring in a church. Pastor, why aren't we having more outreach? Pastor, why aren't we doing some some activities to try to get lost people? Preacher. Do we have anything for, for like an RU or, or outreach? A lot of my friends are struggling with drugs. And preacher, why don't we do this? You start bringing that to your preacher, not, not, not your leader, but you start bringing that to your elders or your, and all of a sudden they're going to say, well, you know, I don't know. And then you know what you say? I'll do it. I'll start it. Preacher, I can't start it. Why not? Be an example. Be an example. All right, I'm done. Lord, we love you and uh, bless this time now. Uh, we look forward to what you have for us in the sessions to come. And Lord, I got about one point of all that that I want to get in this morning. But uh, Lord, I pray that you'd help us in Christ's name. Amen. John